Hi, this is JD Wisgo from selftaughtjapanese.com and this is Transliterate Lab number two, a new project that I'm starting. Just as a quick review for those of you who have not seen uh, the first issue, what I'm going to be doing is taking a short fiction passage uh, in Japanese and translating that to English, uh, including showing some of the research and some of the translation iteration um, to kind of show the process being involved. Um, and if there's any, you know, research about the words or, you know, other related stuff, I'll generally do that during the video. Um, and for the most part, I won't be doing any pre-research, um, which means, you know, I'm not going to start the translation before I record the video or anything. I'm going to be kind of doing it live. Um, I may briefly check uh, for difficulty and kind of pre-select the work, but that's pretty much it. Um, and finally, uh, I'm generally aiming for beginning translators or anybody who's kind of interested in translation. Um, although, of course, anyone's free to watch. So for today, I'm going to be continuing uh, from Akutagawa Ryunosuke's Frog, um, Kaeru. Sa, hajimaru zo. All right, so what we have here is the Kaeru work opened up in Aozura Bunko, uh, which I mentioned last time, but if you don't know, is a place that stores uh, Japanese works that are generally pretty old, several decades old, uh, many of which have uh, basically lost their copyright or the copyright has expired. Um, so last time, uh, just a brief summary, we went over this first sentence and we talked about um, some of the older characters that are used, like this, which is a iru, and also, uh, let's see, the kaheru is kaeru, and we also talked about how atte here uh, really means atte. So just to show the notes briefly, um, this is what we worked on last time, and we ended up with sort of a a rough uh, translation, which is our, you know, best effort in about a half an hour of, of going through this. So I want to kind of reiterate on this uh, before I continue with the second paragraph. Um, so let's read this through and I'll delete this older one. All right. Beside where I'm sleeping, there is an old pond where there are many frogs. Okay. So reading this through again, um, now, you know, it's a day later. So I'm kind of feeling a little different about this I am sleeping part. So let's try to phrase this beside where I sleep, All right? So this, it's shorter and you know, besides getting rid of a, a word and it's, it's simpler. So let's try to use this phrasing to see how it sounds. Beside where I sleep, there's an old pond. Now, this part here, where there are many frogs. So of course, uh, correctness is important and you want to get uh, a proper nuance. Um, but also just general wordiness. In other words, simplifying uh, your prose is very important. And that applies even if you're just writing something you made up yourself. So um, although we're doing translation in this case. So now that I'm looking at this, where there are many frogs. So what we could probably do is with. So that simplifies, gets rid of a word and makes it a little bit easier to read. So let's read through this one more time to see how it sounds. Beside where I sleep, there is an old pond with, uh, I got a typo, with many frogs. Okay, so it sounds pretty good. And if we look at this, um, we actually got rid of two words, right? Which is definitely uh, an improvement. So to me, this is starting to sound pretty good. Um, and we could definitely clean it up more. Or we could at least consider some other options. But let's move on to the second paragraph, okay? <coughs> so if we go back here, and second paragraph's a bit longer. So I'm going to focus less on uh, some of the basic meaning verification. So what I can do here is um, some of the, or actually all of the furigana is going to kind of get messed up. So what I'm going to do is just briefly fix um, the ones like this, ashi, and here to just clean that up. All right. And what I'll do is just go sentence by sentence. Um, so, all right, we'll just separate this out um, and we can break it out later um, or put it back together. Of course, if we need to, see how much we get done in, uh, in the time. So we basically have three sentences here. Um, okay, good. And then, so I'm going to go ahead and clean up. Uh, let's see. There's this part here. Just brief look at these. The Sei and Hakoyanagi. Um, so this here. Okay. Uh, okay, Hakoyanagi. And it'll be easier to read. Um, and I can actually probably just read the original text here. But we got Hinyoku and Namiki. All right. Okay. So, almost done. There's not too much at the end here. There's Itsumo, Komaka, and Garas. 
Okay. So we got this here. It's more Komakai Grass. Um, and then finally we got Harukani. All right, which I think is actually, oh, this would be separate. Yeah, I wish there was an easy way to cut and paste this, but unfortunately there does not appear to be. Okay, good. So now that we got this prepared, um, I'll go ahead and read through this um, and just get a, a rough feel. So we'll just do sentence by sentence for now. In the future, maybe we'll go through the whole paragraph so we can get a, get a better feel for it, but we'll just kind of go step by step. So, Ike no mawari ni wa ichimen ni Okay, so again, just as a brief refresher, this character here is pronounced I, um, and it's kind of from older Japanese. And we have a small tsu, or sorry, a big tsu here, which is actually uh, used as a small tsu. So this would be shigeru. All right, and if you're not sure, you can just check here. Shigeru, there's a bunch of different variations, but shigeru, um, which by the way means growth sick, thickly, if you didn't know, shigeru. And this is like the te form, right? So which is shigette. So it's a big tsu, uh, but we treat it like a small one. <clears throat> okay, and then another one here, um, mahari. So if you remember from the first uh, sentence, we had kaheru, which is actually kaeru. So again, this is something that's kind of a, a older style Japanese. So here, mahari um, is clearly means mawari. So if you're not sure, you can always check it up and say, is there anything called mahari? Um, there's this here, which is, I'm pretty sure, not related. I'm just looking at the meaning. Um, and there's no word called mahari. So we can kind of assume that this is mawari, right? Which means around, uh, or kind of like the periphery, mawari, just to show that. Circumference surroundings environment, in case you don't know that word. So <clears throat> I'm not going to list out all the definitions of the words like I did last time, just to save space. Um, but ike means pawn, just as a refresher. And these two words, uh, ashi is read. Uh, I have seen this word before. I don't know offhand what gama is. Looks like it's a plant, but let's see what it is. It's a toad. Okay. Um, it's also, so we have two different options here. We have this toad and this. So we see this cattail bulvish one um, is the single kanji here. Whereas the frog one is totally different kanji. So it's, it's clearly going to be this one. So we'll probably use cattail. And then we have this shigette iru, and then the ichimen, which is kind of like the whole surface. Um, one side, look all around the front page, one side. So yeah, the whole surface would be, uh, to me, a good translation of that. So let's come and see how this fits in context, though. So again, we got ikim no mawari ni wa ichimen ni ashi ya kama ga shigette iru. All right, so let's just go ahead and try to make a rough translation of this part um, and see what we can do. So we are calling this the pond, which is a common way to call it. So around the pond. Okay, we'll keep the uh, comma this time just to see how it pans out. Um, Ashiya gama. So gama was cattail, if I remember correctly. Um, around the pond uh, were, actually, well, let's get rid of the comma because I'm not thinking it's going to sound well now that I, I see what's next. Around the pond are uh, let's try thickly grow reeds and cattail plants. So I'm not sure if it should be cattails or cattail plants. Um, I could probably check on Google for that, but we'll just go with cattail plants for now. It's a pretty minor, minor thing. I mean, cattail here is, it's a marsh-like plant. So we'll just say cattail plants, um, just for clarity. <clears throat> so we have around the pond, thickly grow reeds, and cattail plants. Now, there's a lot of this time you can spend with the word order, but I'm thinking if I should switch the order of these. Thickly grow reeds around the pond. Uh, thickly grow. Yeah, I think it's okay. Let's just leave it for now. Um, we can always come back to it. So this is a good kind of rough translation. Let's move on. Um, and we can see just from this point, it's kind of uh, all about description. All right, so we want to really make the thing uh, description sound uh, fluid. Um, you know, make the prose really sound important because here, I mean, the content, yeah, it's important, but I would, I would say that the, the nuance, like the, the feeling of it is, is equally important because we're, we're trying to have a set, it's kind of set the stage for the story. Right? Keep in mind, it's only the second paragraph. So here, let's go through this. Sono ashi ya gama no mukou ni wa se no takai hakoyanagi no namiki ga hinyoku kaze ni soyoi de iru. Okay, so 
a little bit longer. Uh, we got a few new words. Mukol is kind of like um, on the other side, um, in case you're not familiar with that word. Uh, Mukol. All right, so you notice there's a different way to write it. Here there's a kol written. Here the kol is abbreviated, um, but it's the same word. Opposite side, other side. No surprise there. Say, um, if you've probably heard, uh, say means back. It also means height. Um, so if you say ga, say ga takai or say ga hikui, which is one way to, a common way to say somebody's tall or short. Um, so this is um, basically a tall hakoni yanagi, which honestly, I think yanagi is a plant, um, but I'm not sure the details. So this is yama narashi no. All right, so it's a specific type of plant. It looks like it's hmm, originally related to China, apparently. So what we could do for this one is just open up another window and see if we get a, a better way to call this. Now, of course, we're going to get Chinese. So, I mean, if you want Japanese, you could kind of do something like this. Yanagi. And it looks like here people are calling this a white poplar. Okay, so that might, that might work. Um, and I'm not a plant expert. I'm not going to do too much uh, extra research here. But let's check this out real quick. Japanese poplar. Okay. So... Let's go ahead with that um, as the running definition for this word. No namiki, right? So this here, this is comes from, I think, naraberu or narabu, which is to line up. So I think this is like a grove of trees, but let's double check. Row of trees, okay, makes sense. Um, here they have a lineup, so it's, it's not necessarily a clump. It's kind of a, a line as per the kanji narabu here. Um, and then hinyoku, now uh, johin means um, basically refined. And Gehin is kind of like the opposite of that, someone that's uncouth. So here we have a uh, Hin. Hin basically means, um, let's see, <clears throat> elegance, class, grace, refinement, taste. So in this case, we have Hin Yoku, right? So Yoku, remember, comes from E, uh, which is also called Yoi, which is basically good, the adjective good. Um, well, it has a bunch of other nuances, but here it's basically like gracefully, right? Because it's like with good grace or uh, with good refinement or taste uh, with elegance right there's a few different ways to translate that um, and of course yoku is the adverbial form right so it's not it's not directly modifying this kaze right when this word here it's more of an adverbial sense so it's it's talking about how the verb happens so what is the verb so yui de yidu so interestingly enough here this verb here looks like the one from tatakao um, to fight let's see i'm pretty sure yeah tatakao so that's a little strange and notice here it doesn't have the uh, soyoi de iru, uh, the other reading here. Although there is, let's see, let's check. So yogu, which I think you need sway in the wind. Okay, so this dictionary has it. Um, the Japanese Japanese one does have this this kanji, which is a little strange. Uh, but soyogu means sway or rustle, same idea. And maybe yudeiru would be another way to describe that. So for whatever reason, there's this kanji which has to be has to do with fighting. So there's probably some origin, but we'll skip that. So anyway, it's swaying in the wind gracefully, right? Makes sense. That's pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and try to translate this um, on the other side of the reeds and cattail plants. Okay, so now we have this is you know we again we have the commas that help us understanding uh, help us understand how things get put together. Um, so here we have basically this line of plants, line or grove of um, plants, which I think was Japanese poplar, if I remember. Um, and they're high, meaning they're, they're tall. Tall is a, a better word for this case, seno takai, right? Because takai by itself can also mean expensive, right? So usually, um, or pretty often say, now this is interesting here. The say, I'm going to make sure I don't have a typo here because it's typically sit. Um, okay, this does say se, which is interesting. Um, let me double check something. Se ga takai. Okay, so if I do se here, so notice, as I thought, typically you say se, se ga takai. So se is kind of like an older, older way to, I believe, to read this kanji. So typically, if you were saying somebody's tall, you would say se ga takai. And you can see here, same kanji, but the reading is clearly se. So there wasn't a typo. Uh, the furigana was listed as se. Um, so we'll read it that way. Um, but just keep in mind with modern Japanese, you would typically use se. All right, so again, the tall, uh, we got the tall Japanese poplar. Um, okay, on the other side of the reeds and cattail plants. All right, so now we got to deal with the word order here. So it's getting a little bit tricky, right? 
So we can just write it out and then we'll probably have to shift around the word order, okay? We'll just say a row of Japanese, popular, uh, a row of tall. We'll just say a tall row, right? That sounds a little natural, a little more natural. Uh, tall of Japanese, popular, uh, suede, mm, sounds good, suede, gracefully, in the wind, right? So, kaze ni soyoi de iru, right? So, I mean, keep in mind here that suede sounds like it's passive tense, or that would be, so that would be was suede, I guess, so suede, yeah, I guess the, the verb tenses match up uh, pretty well here. So let's read through this uh, now that we have a kind of um, attempt at a translation. On the other side of the reeds and cattail plants, a tall grove, Japanese poplar, swayed gracefully in the wind. That actually sounds okay. I was thinking the word order might have to be switched around, um, and maybe it would to kind of clean it up a bit more, but let's move on, all right? So now let me make sure I have all the furigana. Okay, looks good. So, uh, sono mata mukou ni wa shizukana natsu no sora ga atte, soko ni wa itsumo komakai garasu no kake no yaona kumo ga hikatte iru. Okay, cool. So again, places like this, we have a big tsu, is actually a little one, so this is hikatte, right, which is the te form of hikaru, to shine. Um, and another thing, while we're here, we have this yao, um, which actually you should understand is yo. Now it's probably not even going to show it here because it has to do with the way that the characters were used to be written in older Japanese. So here it's basically, whenever you see a yao, it's probably going to be a yo. So in other words, sono yao na would be sono yo na, which means you know, something like that typo. So basically... This yao here, you can think of it as yo, right? This could just be a yo if you want. We'll leave it as yao, but just to know that. <clears throat> All right, so what about the rest of the words, right? So here we have sono mata muko, right? So remember, mata means uh, again. Um, so just to kind of put the words together here, and now what does this sono mean? Sono means that, right? So they're talking about the other side of that. What is that? Well, probably the row of Japanese popular, uh swaying or swayed gracefully in the wind, right? So that's another thing uh, we're talking about on the other side of that. And this mata is kind of like, uh, in Japanese you say sarani, which is sort of like, you know, to another, a further extent, or I should say, how should I say? In this case, we're talking about um, muko in the previous sentence here, right? So this is muko again, but it's mata muko. So it's kind of just extending it. You can imagine it as sort of like the next layer, right? It's beyond something, and then beyond that, once again, that type of thing. Anyway, so, um, we'll just say further, beyond that, is just a kind of rough guess. All right, now we have, uh, and I think I read this as Shizuka, and if you look, typically it's written differently with a ka, right? You notice this is, of course, quiet still, calm. Shizuka, and here there's no ka. And again, keep in mind, sometimes the, the way things are written with the um, mix of kana, or sorry, the mix of uh, hiragana and kanji is different. So, we have shizugana, which over is quiet, natsu no sora. So, further beyond that is a quiet summer sky. Okay, pretty literal, but it sounds okay. Now we have soko ni wa itsumo komakai garasu no kake. So, kake, I'm pretty sure is like kakera, which is like a sliver, or a, a how should I say, a piece. So let's look at kakera first, just to see fragment, broken piece, and kake itself. I'm not sure is that is that's even in the dictionary. Okay, here we go. So kake means kakera, which is what I thought, what I hoped. So that's great. So shard of glass, fragment of glass. No yona, right? It says yao, but it means yona. Kumo ga hikate. So we got an interesting sort of uh, metaphor, or I guess a simile here. So further beyond that is a quiet summer sky. Okay, and then here we got itsumo. So this is always right. So that kind of means that this state of these shining clouds um, are always uh, looking like shards of glass, right? Now, komakai um, is kind of a tricky word. Uh, komakai. It could mean thin or small, fine. So fine is probably going to be a good translation here. It can also be small or detailed, right? Um, it has a few different nuances here. So let's just lay this out. So again, we have soko ni wa, right? So again, this soko is probably talking about this, right? So uh, we're talking about the sky, and now we're saying in that sky, basically, right? 
within, and we'll just try within which. Some, this is a little wordy, but let's see how it sounds, okay? Um, further beyond it is a quiet summer sky, within which is always um, fine uh, clouds. Uh, this is starting to sound a little awkward. So, which which always shines. Let's try... Which, uh, I don't want to use is here because it, it kind of sounds awkward. I want to be active. Use, use the verb here. So, hikaru, which is shine. Which And let's see if there's any other. Because shine, I'm not sure if quite... Oh, I like this. Twinkle, glitter, flash. All right. Which always... Within which always glitters. Um, we'll just say many for now. See how that pans out. It doesn't literally say many. But I want to kind of throw that in and see how it works. Within which always glitters many clouds, like um, fragments of glass. So this is I can tell this is already a little bit awkward, right? Within which always glitters many clouds, like fragments of glass. So it, the word order seems like it needs a little bit of work. Within which always glitters many clouds. Yeah, it's okay. Let's leave it for now. Um, but we could come back to it again if we, you know once we go through these four sentences of this second paragraph. So, now we have saoshite sore da ga minna jisai yori mo haruka ni utsukushiku ike no mize ni sorry, ike no mizu ni utsutte iru. Okay. So, again this second tsu here is a small tsu. So this comes from utsuru which is sort of uh, project or reflect I think is um a better utsuru. Yeah, come out reflect. Okay. In this case it's reflect. Um, probably because we're talking about the water of the pond, right? Ike no mizu. Um, and we got a few other words here. Jisai, probably know this. This is um, actual, like in reality type thing. Fact, truth, reality. Um, and then haruka, <coughs> which is kind of distant or in the, in the distance. Haruka, right far in the distance. It's pretty straightforward and meaning-wise. Sorera, this is the plural of sore. Um, now, sore can mean plural, but sometimes for emphasis, um, we can use sorera, kind of like karera, right? Um, or even bokura, watashi tachira, I don't hear too often, but uh, bokura you hear. So there's a few words that have to do with people, you can add a ra on the end, and this sore is one of them too. So um, another thing is minna. Keep in mind, minna, uh, we typically learn that to mean everyone as like a group of people, but um, it can also be used for objects. And in this case, there's no real people yet um, in the story. So this is uh, talking about these objects or these plants and stuff, right? So, and then finally, just going backwards, we have saoshite. So again, we had yauna, which is actually yona. Similar pattern here. Instead of sao, shite, um, it should actually, at least in terms of our understanding, we should understand it as soste, right? Soste. Okay? Which means, uh, you know, literally it means then uh, you do something. You do something and then, right? But it's kind of an expression which means also or and, and then, that kind of thing. So it, it kind of connects, um, connects sentences, right? To kind of improve the flow in Japanese. So, um, so let's just say and also. Let me change back to writing in English. And uh, all of them, all right, so we have sorera ga minna jisai yori mo. So it's more than actual, right? Which is, what does this mean? Jisai yori mo haruka ni utsushiku. Okay, which is interesting. So I'm not sure what they're quite getting at here. Jisai yori mo. So it's more than they are actually yet. Interesting. Reality, hmm, interesting. So I'm not quite sure what this expression means in this case. Um, so let's just go ahead and do our best job, and we can again come to that, uh, come back to that later. And all of all of them, all of them, mm, we'll just try all of them. All of them are <coughs> beautifully. Um, so this literally now keep in mind this utsukushiku, right? Utsukushi means beautiful. So when we get utsukushiku. Um, there's actually two meanings. One can mean utsukushite, which is it was beautiful, and another one can be the adverbial usage of utsukushi, which is um, basically uh, utsukushiku utsutiru, which is actually I think what's the, what's being used, the second meaning. So this adverb uh, applies to the verb utsuru, right? So even though there's a comma here, which in English, I don't know if we would typically have a comma after an adverb, I guess we could. 
Um, but here, I'm pretty sure this is, you know, it's not the, it's not acting as the te form. It's acting as a adverb um, to modify this verb. All right, so now that we know it's easier to translate, and all of them are beautifully reflecting in the uh, pond's water, pond water? Mm. You just say pond, or just say water of the pond, actually. Water of the pond. We could probably just say pond, but let's try to get it as literally close as possible in the water of the pond, okay? And now we got this harukani. Right now, let me make sure there's not another meaning for Haruka far in the distance much. OK, so now we see the distance part doesn't necessarily make sense because uh, I mean, yeah, the these things may be a little bit distant, but it's I think it's the other meaning here, which is number three, much far, a lot by far. So it's basically, um, you know, like totemo or something, sugoku, daibu. It's to a, a large extent. Right. <clears throat> So this now I'm starting to understand what this means, right? Jisai yori mo, right? And again, this mo here is more for emphasis, right? You could take it out, and I think it would probably still be okay. Um, but it's basically yori mo is more emphatic, uh, stronger phrase than yori, right? So this is basically saying that they're looking much more beautiful than they do in reality, right? So the way I interpret this is, right? You know, they look beautiful, right? But they're reflecting in the pond. Um, even more beautiful, right? Now, I know my phrasing here is not that great, so let's try to clean up the phrasing uh, when we actually write down the translation. And all of them are reflecting in the water of the pond. So let's try to separate this out, is, uh, emphasize this, this beautifully part. Um, so we'll be kind of moving this phrase to the back part. Uh, and all of them are reflecting in the water. Okay, I forgot an article here. In the water of the pond, even more beautifully than... Usual. So this, uh, I don't know if I like this usual part here. Uh, even more beautifully than usual. So yeah, I can't find a great way to translate this naturally at the at the moment. I probably have to think about this, but this is all right. I mean, it, it kind of conveys the meaning even more beautifully um, than usual. Okay, we'll leave that for now. So what I want to do now is um, once I get these, um, since I got these four, I'm going to go ahead and lay these out in one paragraph, so we can kind of just look at this holistically um, and see if the paragraphs are, the sentences fit together, right? So now, let's read through this, okay? Around the pond thickly grew reeds and cattail plants. On the other side of the reeds and cattail plants, a tall row of Japanese poplar swayed gracefully in the wind. Further beyond that is a quiet summer sky, within which always glitters many clouds like fragments of glass. All right, that sounds all right. And all of them are reflecting in the water of the pond, even more beautifully than usual. So when I went through this, um, a few things kind of stuck in my head, right? Just little tugs. So one of them is further beyond that is the quiet. So this here, further beyond that is, sounds a little wordy, right? I kind of want to clean this up. And also the biggest uh, snag I had was this here, and all of them. So, you know, some people say it's not good to start a sentence with and, I think it's okay sometimes, but in this case, um, it just kind of stopped stopped my pace. Right? It kind of broke the flow. I, I didn't really like how it connected. Um, so let's just get rid of, because this, this idea of soshite here, written as soshite, but soshite, um, sometimes it just gets translated away, in my opinion, at least when I've translated. Sometimes you can say and, and then. Um, there's different ways to translate it, but sometimes it may just actually get removed if it's, the, it's kind of implied, right? So let's try this. Um, each of them, right? Each of them reflected. Let's do this, reflected. Just change the tense, see if it sounds better. Each of them reflected in the water of the pond, even more beautifully than usual. Okay, I still don't like the usual. That's my other beef with this um, translation. But let's go to this part, as it might be a little easier to fix. Further beyond that is a quiet summer sky. Okay, so further beyond that is a quiet summer sky. All right, so I think this that is actually not needed, All right? So let's cut this out and make sure it sounds nice. Further beyond is a quiet summer sky. Okay, that works. So we could try to get rid of the verb is, because again, we kind of want to avoid cluttering things up with is. It's not a very active verb, even you know when you're doing your own writing. Um, we could say further beyond uh, a quiet summer sky. 
can't think of a good verb for that. But we could we could probably refactor it to be a little more active. Um, to me, this is okay. I mean, I don't mind having some is's and, and ours, you know, in descriptions like this. But that's that's one way to to refactor it. Um, and here, the other thing that just caught my attention now is the tense of this, right? Um, within which always glittered. So I have glitters here, um, and thickly grow. So I'm trying to keep my tenses consistent, right? That's another thing that if you're doing your own writing, you know, you may be used to that, but especially if you're translating, um, you know, you may be looking at the tenses of the, the prose, the actual, you know, Japanese text, the original text, and that may confuse you. So uh, it's good to just double check. So here we have grow, and this is a present tense, reads, other side of the uh, grow, uh, where is it? Mm, suede. Okay, so here, now I notice, right, we have... Grow, which is present tense, and then we have suede, right? So that already is a problem. It doesn't match up. And if we remember from the first part, um, we also had, and I, let me go ahead and just put this in the front. Beside where I sleep, there is an old pond with many frogs. All right, so again, we're using the present tense here, right? It's not was, it's is. So let's kind of uh, keep things uniform and try to stay with present tense. Okay, so let's check all of our verbs. Around the pond, thickly grow weeds and cattail plants. Okay, on the other side of the reeds, cut them with uh, the of Japanese sway. All right, sway, gracefully in the wind. Good. Further beyond is, right? That's the, the right tense. Is a quiet summer sky within which always glitters. Okay, that's correct. Many clouds like fragments of glass. So I'm going to put a comma here just because I'm feeling that the flow might be a little bit better or at least better to my ears um, to kind of separate this phrase out. So by doing this, um, it kind of sets it apart. You know, not just physically, but just in terms of the pause that when you're reading or, you know, you, out loud or even in your head. So I'm going to try this. We'll read it one more time before we finish, though. Each of them reflected. Okay, so again, tense, right? Each of them reflects in the water of the pond even more beautifully than usual. So this usual, I mean, I'm starting to get used to it. Um, there's probably still better phrasing here, um, but I think it's okay um, for our purposes today. So I'm starting to like the way this is panning out, um, at least for our, you know, quick translation here in just a half hour, an hour, a half an hour or so of, uh, of work. So let's read the, through the whole thing and see what it sounds like and make sure if there's anything else that's, you know, obvious that we're missing. Um, we'll start from the beginning here. Beside where I sleep, there is an old pond with many frogs. Around the pond thickly grow reeds and cattail plants. On the other side of the reeds and cattail plants, a tall row of Japanese poplar sway gracefully in the wind. Further beyond is a quiet summer sky, within which glitters many clouds, like fragments of glass. Each of them reflects in the water of the pond, even more beautifully than usual. Uh, excuse me, even more beautifully than usual. Okay, so... There's still a few, definitely a few things that I would probably want to iterate. Um, I'm not going to go through these now because it might take some time and another sitting, you know, kind of taking a, a break a few hours or, you know, a day or two, come back to it. Uh, but this, the thickly here is kind of sticking to me. Um, I kind of get stuck on that. You know, I, I like, I would prefer to put the verb here um, around the pond, grow. But grow thickly to me uh, doesn't sound great either. Grow, we, yeah, so... I would probably need to refactor this, you know, adjust it at a bigger sense, a bigger scale, shift around some words, maybe use some, some different phrasing. Around the pond, thickly grow reeds and cattail plants. Yeah, yeah, uh, I can't think of anything better right now, but um, I would try to uh, tighten that up and make it flow a little better. Um, whistling the wind, that's okay. Within which, and the within which, you know, it's from the beginning, this is a phrase I tend to use, but it's, it is a little wor wordy. Um, so I would probably try to clean that up. Uh, further beyond is a quiet summer sky. Um, within, I could ac actually try to remove the witcher. Let's try this out, see if this is even better. Further beyond is a quiet summer sky. Within always glitters many clouds. Okay, yeah, that's all right. Uh, I think it's actually probably better than it was before. Um, within always. All right, so, and again, the within always glitters. This also is kind of sticking to me. I'm getting stuck on the flow here. So, I would probably think about this a little more. Within always glitters. Mm. Yeah, and notice I'm using glitters here as the active verb. I could change it and say, you know, within were always many clouds. 
um, or within our always many clouds, or even I could say, let me just show you one idea. I'm not gonna fi finalize this, but I could say, I could take this, and this first part I, I do like, but here's another option, right? Just to give you something to think about. Further beyond is a quiet summer sky. Um, within many clouds, always glitter or glitter. Um, glitter, like, and this time we'll get rid of the comma. Okay. So, um, let's see which one do we like better. Further beyond is a quiet summer sky. Within many clouds, yeah, and this is I'm definitely getting stuck on this. Let's try where. All right, which we used in the in the previous paragraph, um, but then we ended up changing that to with. Okay, further beyond is a quiet summer sky, where many clouds always glitter like fragments of glass. I actually really like this. So this to me is starting to sound a little better. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this here. Um, get rid of this stuff, and yeah, it's it's definitely uh, gradually you know starting to be uh, better and better in terms of the flow. Um, you know we can go back to the meaning once in a while and double check, but. The, the paragraphs here, um, the, the Japanese text, is relatively straightforward. There could be some nuance that I'm missing. Um, you know, like I said, the plant here, this gamma part, I'm not too familiar with that plant, so I might double check. Um, you know, I could change Japanese poplar to poplar or you know, some other variation. There might be a slightly more natural way to say that. So I'm not going to claim the content is 100% correct, but for the most part, um, I'm pretty confident about that. Also, cattail plants, I would probably do a Google search. You know, do people typically call them cattails or cattail plants? Uh, because, you know, you don't want to say plant if you really, unless you really have to, right? So, but that's, I think, um, I think a good run for today. So, just to kind of close out, um, just a brief advertisement here uh, for my new book that just was released a few days ago. Um, it's called uh, The Spirit Drum. Um, the original title was Ayakashi no Tsuzumi. And it's by an author, um, Kyusaku Yume no, uh, who is a pretty eccentric, uh, unique writer um, from, I guess, about, the story's about 90 years old, so it's, it's what I would consider maybe classic Japanese or at least early uh, 20th century Japanese, so it's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's about a, a curse uh, across uh, several generations, across a, um, a century, um, and how it impacts two different families, so it's pretty cool. Um, I really liked it, so I thought it would be cool to translate that and, and publish it um, for you know some people to check out in English. Um, and the full Japanese text of this book is available online. Um, so for those, those of you studying Japanese, um, you can kind of compare. Now, it is a bit advanced, so um, you know, I would kind of make sure that you have a little experience under your belt before you, you tackle this. Um, and I actually have some other books that are a little easier. But this is the one I'm kind of focusing on now. So, and in the YouTube video description below, you'll see some links, uh, including a link for this book. And also from my blog, Self Taught Japanese, um, which uh, where I have a bunch of articles uh, about different things about grammar, uh, Japanese grammar, reviews of books. You know, not just my books, but uh, you know other people's books, um, movies, and you know culture points, and you know some other translation notes. I have some other translation um, analysis and stuff like that. So, anyway, please check it out um, if you like. Thanks for watching.